Welcome back to Educator.com's AP English Language and Composition course. This lesson is a practice session for the synthesis essay. Let's get started. All right, we begin as always with a brief lesson overview. We're going to look at where to find the prompt that we're looking at. We're using a real prompt from a real test. We're going to analyze the prompt. We're going to read over the texts and go for some main ideas. We're going to look at possible approaches to answering the question in the essay. We're going to look at the scoring guidelines that the AP uh, and the College Board use to score the essays on the test. We're going to look at the sample essays provided on the College Board website. And we're going to conclude with some basic tips for the synthesis essay. All right, this prompt is available on the College Board's website. It is one of three actual free response questions used on the 2011 AP English Language and Composition Test. We'll take the 2012 questions at the end of this course. Uh, this is question one, located on page two of the PDF. And there are seven texts that go with it. All right, we're going to, be, we're going to begin with the prompt here. The prompt begins by defining a term. It talks about locavores, so you're going to have to write about locavorism in some way. The prompt offers a hypothetical situation, a community developing a locavore movement, and it asks you to address that situation. And it makes some specific demands. It asks you to use at least three sources, which means you can ignore up to four. It asks you to create a coherent, well-developed essay, so it's got to hold together and it's got to go into enough detail to make sense. They, uh, the a prompt asks you to identify the key issues involved in locavorism and to examine their implications. Don't forget that part. And finally, it asks you to cite your sources, but don't just summarize them. Use them to support your main point. All right, let's look at the texts and see what they say. Uh, source A, which is by Mazur, lists a variety of reasons to buy and eat local, including economic, nutritional, sensory, and ethical concerns. So these are all reasons that locavores give, and give for locavorism. Source B, which is Smith and McKinnon, qualifies a common argument in favor of locavorism. It holds that the nutritional benefits of fresher food are actually nominal. So that nutritional explanation up here, they're saying, uh, well, it actually doesn't really, it's not that big a difference. But the source does concede that the experiential difference is profound. This food tastes better. It's a better experience to buy and eat it. Now, source C, which is McWilliams, qualifies the locavore arguments about food miles and carbon footprints. Okay, and it holds that mileage alone doesn't tell the whole story and consumers should have other concerns as well. So this is another qualifying argument. Source D, Loader et al, compares the carbon footprints of various food categories. This one is just a simple graph, so you can go look at the graph. All right, source E, which is Gogoi, uh, discusses the impact of the locavore movement on the recent farm bill. So we have a governmental and legislative perspective now. Source F, Roberts, points out problems with the locavore, or as he spells it, localvore, so if you quote him, make sure you get that right, principle, namely that food production in the United States is decentralized, and it can be difficult to define locally sourced foods. Okay, so there's another qualification. And finally, source G, Hallett, is a comic strip from an environmental magazine, and it parodies the locavore movement. Okay, parody is important by both pointing out the lack of food source near the character's home, which is apparently above the Arctic Circle, judging by the name of the comic strip and the landscape you see, and it also parodies the convenience of a local supermarket. All right, so now 